Hi, Graham Vincent, violin maker and musician. I'd like to talk about violin varnish and finishes. Um, I think a lot of people feel that this is something, a subject that's kind of shrouded in mystique and people want to keep their own special secret source to themselves. And I think there's, there's an element of that, but um, I'm going to tell you everything I know and I will not pretend for one moment that I know everything. I really don't. I know how I produce a nice um, professional finish um, and I've, I've changed the finish I've used. It's developed over time. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about all of those things as we go. So there are several things that you need to understand about a violin finish. It needs to be you know, resistant to the sort of wear and tear that happens in general usage. It needs to make the thing look good. And also it needs to not hamper the sound too much. Okay, so one thing a violin varnish does not do is cover up mistakes. And this is the, the crucial first point to mention you will make almost any finish look good if all of your preparation work is amazing. If there's, there's you know, you, you have scraped and sanded everything, all of your corners are beautifully crisp in terms of the shape, but there aren't any sharp edges. Um, that will make finishing so much easier. Likewise, if you rush things and you put a nice finish onto a roughly sanded body, which you were just itching to get towards the finishing stage, so you've rushed it, it doesn't matter how good the varnish is, it's going to look poor. So preparation is key. And I'm not the first person to say that, but it's very, very true. And I have most definitely fallen foul of that in the past. Um, there's an absolute sure way to make your hand-built instrument look like um, it's been knocked together in a shed and isn't worth any money, and that is don't prepare before you start varnishing. So, um, oh, it's, it's difficult to know what to talk about because I, I am going to jump around, as I often do in these little chats, but I'm going to jump around between so many different aspects of this because they do, they do all tie in. Um, so I've said sand and prepare the actual woodworking side of it. Next, before you put any finish onto your violin, if you can get the colour as near to being something that you like before you start sealing and varnishing, everything becomes easier. There are some things that you can do to improve the colour, which work, and there are some things that you must never do because they will destroy any chance of you getting a good finish. Things you can do, ultraviolet light, put it in the sun, put it in a light box. Um, a light box is a fantastically easy thing to produce. It's something about the size of a tea chest. It's got silver um, foil on the inside. It's got UV lights. It's got normally a glitter ball motor in the top, which slowly turns the violin round. That's not essential, um, but it, it kind of helps to get an even uh, sort of distribution of UV. And you, you might want to consider putting some sort of ventilation in there as well to the outside to extract fumes from finishes and if for some reason you end up using UVC you'll need to extract the ozone that's produced in the UV chamber. So another thing you can do is use a very limited range of stains on the wood. Some artificial stains and some natural stains soak into end grain and side grain differentially and stain them differentially. Avoid those like the plague. Um, other stains and the, the best the best one that I know is tea sort of don't 
stain the end grain overly heavily and they stain everything evenly, which is fantastic. Um, and the reason that's fantastic is because of your chatoyance that you want to maintain in the violin finish. If I move this, you will look, you see that moving ripple, yeah? You see that if I put my finger on a dark, that dark patch there, lo and behold, it's gone. You know, it's, it's moved on somewhere else. That's because what you're seeing is reflection on the fibres of the wood. And, you know, depending where they are in relation to the light, then obviously their reflection they give is, is different. If, however, because what you're seeing is a grain where the wood, the, the wood grain does this, and you've cut across the top, some of those fibres do hit the surface more obliquely than others. If you put a stain on there which stains end grain differentially to side grain, to normal grain, then you will get superficially what looks like the same appearance, except there won't be any sort of movement or change at all, because you know, one patch will have been stained dark and then the one next to it won't have been. So you'll lose that wonderful shimmer, that sort of chatoyance, as we call it. So we haven't even got as far as putting any finish on yet, but that's all really essential. So you should have gone from something that's in the white to something that is beautifully prepared, no scratch marks, no sharp edges as such, but, but a sort of crispness still uh, to the corners and so on. And it should be a sort of a, a warm biscuity colour. Um, I mean, obviously other, you can do other colours, but that's the one that will tend to get you closest to what we generally think of as a violin. I'm not a big fan of orange violins as such. I tend to be either on the slightly paler sort of end or down at the sort of the slightly browner end, not the really dark brown, um, but anyway. So, the next thing that you need to know is that your varnish probably will have some colour in it. And again, you don't want colour going into the grain because it will differentially stain things. So you have to seal it. And there's a process called sealing, um, which is like the early part of creating something called a ground. In many respects, you can consider them to be the same process, but people will seal violins with all sorts of things, um, whether it's egg albumin, um, Sort of, um, you can you can seal them with a um, with a with a, a thin down hide glue, um, which you then subsequently go over um, with alum to actually sort of denature the protein a little bit. You can, I, I mean, people use um, some of the uh, sort of milk derived chemicals like that, the oh gosh, caseins and so on. Um, a lot of people use spirit stuff, you know, like like effectively sort of um, shellacs. Uh, you could use a sanding sealer. You could use, uh, a lot of people use oil-based varnishes that's thinned down. A lot of people use hardening, you know, curing oils. Um, I have, over the time I've been making violins, I've tried different things. I've used, um, the hide, the, 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 the hide glue I mentioned with the alum. I have used um, Danish oil on one occasion. I've used a, um, oh, what do I use? Oil varnish thinned down with terps, spirit varnish thin, thinned down with alcohol. Um, but uh, I have, uh, yeah, I did use the alb albumin on one occasion as well. Um, and I did the inside of the violin, dactylar violin with that one as well. But what you're trying to do in each of these cases is actually to sort of seal the surface and just penetrate a little bit into the timber 
and give a secure footing for varnishes and grounds to sit upon. So you are stopping coloured things getting into the wood. Okay, if that makes sense. Because when you look at this, most of the colour there is on is in the actual varnish itself. And where the varnish has worn away, you know, for example, on the edges here, you get a totally different appearance um, where, you know, years of human sweat and dirt and so on have actually sort of coloured it. Um, okay, so whatever you decide to use, you put your sort of fairly thin sealer on and you let it dry and then you cut it back a tiny bit just to denib it. Denibbing basically means in the process of using a very fine paper to actually just knock off any, where you've got a bit of dust or a little bit of grain sticking up, which is trapped as because of surface tension, it's held a bit of the finish. It then dries, so you have a thick lump of finish. It feels like a little lump or a nib, as we call it. So denibbing basically is just rubbing those gently away. Um, then some people do something called a ground, some people effectively just seal again, some people don't differentiate between the two. Uh, I, I, I'm probably one of those people who doesn't really differentiate between the two. I kind of think of sealing the violin and then sealing it again, which, you know, creates a build up on the surface a little bit, which I call the ground effectively. Uh, and then this ground is again knocked back and there's all sorts of interesting stories about, you know, what's found in the old Cremonese ground and, and how they used to use, um, what's the word, pumice and so on in the ground. Whereas I, I, think, um, I think there's a lot of evidence that they were just using pumice as one of the abrasives to actually just flatten the ground back again. Okay, so we've got this biscuit coloured violin that's now sealed. So anything that you, any finish that you put onto it now will bond to the surface, that's important, but it won't penetrate into the surface and it won't give a differential stain of colour. That's really important. And I'm, I'm hoping you're starting to see now why I'm not going into massive detail about every single ingredient, because it's the processes and the reasons that you're doing this that are more important than the ingredients, as far as I'm concerned. Um, like I say, I've used lots of different ways of sealing and I've used French polish, I've used uh, oil varnish and I've used uh, spirit varnish on violins uh, and proprietary ones are ones I've made myself. And I've had generally, you know, acceptable results with all of those. I've got a couple of problems, which I'll, I will cover. Um, so, what are you going to do next? Okay, you've got your sealed and prepared and, and, and violin with a ground on it. It's all denibbed. It's beautiful. You're looking at it. There's no bare wood anywhere. You're really happy with it. Oh, I ought to mention, and I did warn you I was going to be jumping about, of course, the neck, the back of the neck is finished differently. Okay, so what I tend to do, sorry to jump about, is at the stage where I do the first sealing, I leave the neck without anything. And then when I do like the second coat, I will then put, um, I've used various things over the years, but I tend to use t um, um, pure tongue oil on the, the neck now. And the reason I do that is tongue oil, although it takes quite a while to harden, Luckily, it's okay in a UV box. Um, it's It doesn't build up much, and it is the thing that gives the closest feel to, uh, as though you're touching real wood, bare wood, even though it is finished. So it's really useful for that reason. And yeah, and I tend to, at several stages during the finishing process, put a bit more on the neck and just rub it back with something finer than P800. P800 would be the coarsest I would use on, on the neck. 
Um, so you've got a choice. You, you, sorry, you've got to choose. So the most common ones are a spirit varnish or an oil varnish. May I suggest um, that you buy your spirit varnish? Just go online, find, um, well, www.joha.eu forward slash en forward slash. That will get you to Hamel GmbH in Deutschland. And they produce a perfectly good range of spirit and oil varnishes, which will absolutely do the job you know, until such time in the future when you decide that you would like to brave, you know, making your own varnish. So, order some oil varnish. Um, with, with regard to choosing colours and so on, may I suggest that you don't go wild. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't go for the, the brightest red that you could possibly find and so on. A little bit of subtlety is not a bad thing, um, but there we go. So, um, my computer screen's just turned off for some reason. Oh, it's back again. Right, okay. Um, and follow the instructions. Uh, basically, it in, and you'll need to countless videos on YouTube, varnish, brushes, brushing it on and all that. Do all of that. Follow the instructions, several coats. And if you do that and do it carefully and cut it back in between gently, so you're denibbing, don't try and build up too much on any one coat, then that will inexorably get you to a finish like this. It will show up every single little imperfection uh, in your arching, your shaping, sanding, scraping, everything will show up, um, but you will end up with this nice, smooth, slightly glossy kind of surface, um, which is a really good finish for a violin. So that, um, that's going to get you a sort of one color violin without any distressing, without any sort of makeup in its colouring and ageing and so on. Another approach is to use an oil varnish. Um, and again, I would suggest at this stage you just go and buy some. Follow the instructions, it's much the same process. And if you just go the, through the process of just using the one colour and just making sure you do a nice job, again you will end up with effectively something that's not dissimilar to this, uh, you know, minus the wear. Okay. Um, what, uh, th then let's talk about, um, you know, I just, I, I'm, there's gonna be huge areas of this subject that I miss, but I'm, I'm doing my best uh, under the circs. Um, then there is a group of makers who, and players who want a distressed finish. So having got the violin to this stage, like this, we'll then get in there and artificially wear and remove some of the finish, wear it again, add some color to the, to the exposed bits, and basically, take it through to looking like a, an antique instrument. Uh, and that's done, you know, you, you, you chip away at the finish. Some people actually will put, you know, brown packing tape on and rip it off, you know, but like a ball of it scrunched up and just use it to rip at the surface. Um, obviously you need, look at pictures of old violins and follow the sort of wear patterns. The wear patterns are created by, you know, it being put down. So. You know, there's often wear here and here. Um, there's always wear on the back, on the high spots of the back where it rests on the surface. Similarly, on the back of the, um, the peg box. And then there's just general wear from contact with, with the person playing it. Lots of wear around here. Um, lots of wear and sweat on the top here. Um, abrasion 
here. So, so on the back, normally you'd you'd have sort of a lot of varnish missing up here from where it's where it's you know been handled like that. You know, um, so the varnish sort of off here. Big patch of it missing here. Lots and lots of wear around the edges, especially on on the on the top from the bow in the inside of there, um, and then sort of a lot of material, you know, a lot of finish missing here. Um, so let's let's say you got your tape out and you've been chipping away with like a lollipop sized bit of wood and what have you, because you want to be chipping at the surface with things that don't damage the timber itself. Um, you may want to add a few dinks and dents. Um, I personally, I hate doing that. I, I don't do that. I've done, I have done uh, two violins which have got some artificial wear like that. Um, it's, but it's, it's I, don't, I don't like doing it and I'll show you what I do in a minute. Um, but then you then start to need to consider putting the color onto that wear. I mean, there, there's, you know, a lot of people um, in the past have gone to the extent of using horse manure for actually sort of colouring up some bits of the violin. Um, uh, not something I've done. No, I just can't quite bring myself to do that. <laughs> um, and then it's almost just repairing it as, as you would if you were repairing a violin that came into the workshop. You know, it's making good all the, the wear and bringing it back to the sort of the state that a violin that's been in hundreds of years of wear and has been looked after and repaired at each time. So probably some French polish, for example, over the top, you know, some color, some dirt. Um, I'll talk about those in a bit. What I, where I've got to now, and this is a really odd example because this violin is actually, um, Spanish cedar, so it's a really odd colour to start off with. It's almost like a mahogany colour. But this is an oil finish. Um, but what you'll see that I've done, in addition to doing everything that I've said on that one, I also effectively have got in with some makeup, so to speak, and I've put in a little bit of colour in the areas where, you know, where wouldn't reduce the thickness of the varnish as quickly. So a bit of colour in around here, a bit of colour normally in these areas which are kind of protected. Um, you know, a bit of colour in underneath the overhangs and so on. So it, it just starts to break up the colour. A bit, bit, bit of colour underneath the fingerboard, a bit of colour generally um, where it would get dirty and it wouldn't be disturbed, you know, underneath the tailpiece. I, I often put a bit of colour, extra dirt, if you like, underneath the bridge feet where the finishes are often mucked about with. And, but I almost, I, I, I don't ever now, I, like I say, I've done it a couple of times, I don't ever chip and dent the surface at all because funnily enough, if you look at a, um, a lot of old instruments, Although there's generally a lot of wear to the actual varnish, there's often very little actually in the way of physical damage to the thing itself. And I find just a, a tiny little couple of dots of dark colour here and there are sufficient to actually make it look of that age. Um, so I've yeah, I, oh, at th 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 what stage do I do that colouring? Okay, I, I tend to, if I'm going to be doing an oil finish, like on this one, I've done, I think, two or three layers, and then I got in with the colour. So, one thing that's absolutely essential with violin finishes, whatever they are, is remember that violin finishes need to be transparent. So... Your choice of what materials to use to actually colour the varnish, or as a separate thing to colour, um, you know, it, you know, makeup if you like, which is what I tend to call it. Um, it needs to be transparent. Artist pigments 
a lot of them are not transparent, some of them are. So the easiest way to get pigments which are light fast, have been tested and known to work for generations and um, are ready mixed and in a tube and ready to go is to buy artists oil paint. Okay, that suggests you're using an oil finish and that is one of the advantages of using an oil finish is that you just literally can grab from a tube some of these things you can add a tiny bit to one or two of the layers of varnish if you wish. So on this one for example I think the same colour that I used mixed sort of 50-50 with varnish to add a little bit of a little bit of historical shading and variation. I had also on the layer before mixed a little bit with the varnish itself um, and I can't remember exactly which one it is. I've, I've got three or four oil-based um, transparent um, oil paints. There aren't that many. You're looking for yellows, browns and reds. Look them up. Um, and the only other colours and paints, which really are paints that I use, are I use, for example, Payne's Grey occasionally just to add a tiny little bit of dirt. So I might well put a bit of dirt in here, but it wouldn't just be Payne's Grey because dirt isn't grey, it isn't black. It's a sort of this mixture of grey and purple and green and brown and, and it varies, but it's, it's sweat and accumulations of ugh, all sorts of stuff. Um, so I don't know if you can see it there, but to, to get that look of age in there is really easy, basically. You've got some colour in the varnish, which I've then followed up by a bit more of it um, to sort of colour in, like I call it, make, put, think of it as putting makeup on. So I put some makeup on there, if you like. I've then made a darker mix of it, which I've just used literally just in the corners. And then I've got in there with some gray. Okay. And then, oh, oh I should, what I should say is the, um, the layer that's the color, same as the varnish, I tend to do, and then I cover all of that with, an, I do another layer of varnish over the whole instrument. And then I get into doing the dirt, if you like. Um, so, I know I'm jumping around a lot here. Um, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to say is it's, I mean, th there are loads of different recipes online and you can see them, you just type in, you know, spirit varnish, violin, recipe, you'll find some. They're all good, they're fine. Same with oil finishes. Um, and there's X number of ways of skinning a cat. You know, they're all, they all probably work. Um, I would say if you go down the route of making your own oil varnish, as I have done for a large number of my violins, you do have to be quite careful to make sure that you produce a varnish that's hard enough. One of the, um, you know, one batch of varnish I made, the, the tendency was for it to be right at the tender end of what is acceptable. Um, so the, the batch I made after that, I made sure I cooked it to, to absolutely to death. Uh, and also um, added more cobalt secative to the to to the mix before it's added uh, before it's used. A secative is a, 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 a sort of a, accelerates the drying process. Um, and uh, yeah, we we know that you know Guarneri, we know that Stradivarius used used um, some. Um, the cobalt one is the one that people use nowadays, but I think Strad and uh, Guarneri used um, a, a rather more toxic one, <laughs> which is all they had at, at the time. But we, uh, you know, there's no point killing off your musicians, is there? Um, then, if you want, um, and this this is something I do occasionally. Did I do it on this one? You know, I think I did do it on this one. Most old, most historical violins 
have been through the repair shop many, 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 many times and they've been cleaned up and polished and it's really tempting for repair men or women to just get a little bit of French polish out and just whiz over the thing and give it a sort of a rub over with shellac. And because of that, we're kind of used, to, regardless of what the actual finish is itself, we're used to seeing that sort of French polished look on the surface. Uh, so I've done that. Um, I'm also planning to try completely French polishing from start to finish um, a few violins because I actually really enjoy French polishing and it does give a, a very nice finish. I've yet to work out exactly how I'm going to get the sort of colours that I want because French polishes are, um, uh, they come in a sort of a, a limited range of colours um, and um, the sort of oil-based pigments that I've been using up till now obviously won't do. I'm People who do a lot of repair work, I do some, tend to have, um, you know, a whole collection of um, different sort of spirit, soluble sort of um, sort of colours and what have you in powder form generally, which they which they mix with um, with shellacs and what have you. Um, so perhaps I need to um, buy myself a, a set of repair pigments, really, so I can play around and and get a nice sort of a, a nice colour if I do go down that that sort of French polishing route. Um, what else? What else is there to say? Like I say, this, you know, I'm intending this video to kind of give you an idea about what it is you're trying to achieve rather than, you know, a whole set of recipes. None of these recipes are secret. You can find all of them online easily. Um, so I, I hope it's helped. Look, if you if you don't subscribe to my channel, please do. That's great. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully you'll see some more of these. I hope this was useful. Um, I'm not sure it will be. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, please leave any comments below. Try and keep them polite. And um, even if you think this was totally useless and I waffled on too much, um, tell me what it is you'd like to know and um, as long as it's reasonable I will um, try and help okay so thanks very much for listening cheers folks look after yourselves bye